Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is valvular vegetations. Now this will be a short video, but I put it together because students are often confused by the range of vegetations that can involve cardiac valves and what exactly is the clinical significance of these vegetations. So I'm going to uh, focus on the morphologic findings of infective endocarditis and compare and contrast the different vegetations that we see in these various disease processes. So this is a figure uh, from Robbins and Kumar, Basic Pathology, showing the approximate size and distribution of the vegetation seen in rheumatic heart disease, infective endocarditis, non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, and Liebman-Sachs endocarditis. Now, I think the important thing to recognize is not to memorize the size and distribution, but rather to understand the pathophysiology of these vegetations and ultimately what is the impact on the patient. So for example, in acute rheumatic fever, yes, we do get these verrucae, one to two millimeter vegetations on the lines of closure, but they have minimal clinical significance and do not have a real impact on your patient's health. Now you can know that they exist, but we don't use this diagnostically, uh, nor is it important uh, for prognosis. Now, by contrast, infective endocarditis, where we can get large, friable uh, vegetations, these can flick off into the circulation, resulting in septic emboli, which can have profound consequences for your patients. And you need to be able to recognize the clinical signs and symptoms so that you can uh, treat the patient appropriately. In addition, as you can see in this figure, these uh, uh, vegetations can destroy the valve, uh, and this can lead to acute uh, regurgitation. Now, non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis tends to arise in the setting of a procoagulant state. And these vegetations are sterile, composed of fibrin and platelets, and they're loosely attached uh, to, the, uh, to the valve. Now, they, uh, like the uh, uh, vegetations in infective endocarditis, can be flicked into the uh, circulation where they can cause systemic emboli. They're emboli, but they are not septic because these are sterile. And finally, in Liebman-Sachs endocarditis, we can see here that we can get uh, these vegetations uh, pretty much anywhere on the valves or even the wall of the heart. Uh, and these are due to repeated injury, and I'll go over the pathophysiology of that in a moment. Uh, and what they can cause is valve scarring and fusion. Uh, these don't tend to be uh, thrown off into the circulation, resulting in emboli, but they can cause uh, so much damage that it actually resembles chronic rheumatic heart disease. So let's begin uh, with a brief discussion of acute rheumatic fever. This is actually covered in a separate video uh, looking at valvular uh, pathology. But just to remind you, uh, we can get valvular inflammation in acute rheumatic fever in which we get fibrinoid necrosis and fibrin deposition along the valvular lines of closure, leading to those tiny one to two millimeter uh, vegetations called verruci. And these can involve the mitral valve and or aortic valve. These are some additional findings that I discuss in that other video. But let's take a look just at our uh, cardiac findings regarding the valves. And here are the verruci. They're these tiny little uh, bits right here on the very edge. Now I point this out because some students look at this and they think this or this or this is the vegetation. That is not what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here is valve thickening uh, due to uh, chronic rheumatic heart disease. And we know this patient has chronic rheumatic heart disease because look at the cordi, look how thick they are. That is another um, finding that we see in that. So these are the tiny verruci of uh, acute rheumatic heart uh, disease. Now it's time to talk about infective endocarditis. I'm going to linger here for a little bit. Uh, infective endocarditis is caused by microbial infection of the heart valves uh, and or mural endocardium. Uh, what we will get on the valves is vegetations of thrombotic debris and organisms. And these can be very destructive to tissue. Uh, most of the time they're bacterial, but we can also see uh, endocarditis uh, due to uh, fungi uh, or viruses. There are two clinical syndromes we see in infective endocarditis. An acute endocarditis, uh, which is characterized by rapidly progressive destructive lesions with a high morbidity and mortality, even with appropriate therapy. Uh, and these uh, can arise in uh, damaged or healthy heart valves, and the characteristic uh, organism will be Staphylococcus aureus. By contrast, we have subacute endocarditis, which has a protracted clinical course over weeks to months, and nonspecific symptoms such as a low-grade fever. Patients tend to recover with appropriate therapy, and subacute endocarditis is most common when heart valves are damaged. This can be in the setting of congenital heart disease or perhaps uh, in degenerative changes. 
uh, and the organisms most commonly implicated in this will be viridens group streptococci. Now, the risk factors for infective endocarditis include structural heart uh, abnormalities, all of which are covered uh, in the uh, cardiac videos uh, for uh, Pathology Central. Uh, so rheumatic heart disease, congenital heart disease, mitral valve prolapse, and degenerative cardiac lesions all set up uh, a, um, an environment in which bacteria in particular can latch on and then cause infection. We can also uh, look at external factors such as hemodialysis, long-term intravascular uh, catheters, cardiac devices uh, such as pacemakers or implantable defibrillators, and injection drug use. So there are a variety of clinical features uh, that we see in acute endocarditis, uh, so fevers, chills, weakness, and a flu-like illness. And then uh, if there's valve destruction, we can hear a murmur. Septic emboli, I've already referred to before. Uh, and these septic emboli uh, can give rise to hemorrhagic lesions under the nails, which I'll show you in a moment. In addition, uh, we can get Osler nodes, which are subcutaneous nodules of the pulp of the digits due to immune complex uh, deposits. Uh, so those hemorrhagic lesions include splinter hemorrhages, Janeway lesions, and Roth spots. And I'll show you nice examples of all of these. And complications of infective endocarditis include uh, glomerulonephritis due to antigen antibody complex deposition, because remember, we have ongoing uh, inflammation, uh, and sepsis. So let's begin uh, by looking at splinter hemorrhages, which are called this because they resemble a splinter under the nail. So you can see an example here uh, and here, as well as here in an individual with lighter skin tones. These are Janeway lesions, uh, which I uh, show as a hemorrhagic lesion on the palms or soles. Uh, in uh, darker skin types, uh, they can appear almost like tiny bruises. Uh, here uh, we see an example of septic emboli. Uh, this can have a profound effect on your patient. So uh, if a patient has an undiagnosed uh, infective endocarditis, they may present with stroke-like symptoms. Uh, and then here we have our Osler nodes, which are tender subcutaneous nodules in the pulp of the digits. And then finally, our Roth spots. So these are oval retinal hemorrhages uh, caused uh, by tiny emboli. Now, when we talk about the vegetations that we see in infective endocarditis, uh, they tend to be friable and bulky, and as I mentioned, prone to embolization, leading to septic infarcts. It tends to affect the left heart, so aortic and mitral valves more commonly than the right heart. As I know you're all aware, uh, right heart is associated with IV substance uh, use, and this is what we will frequently see as a classic uh, clinical vignette uh, in exam questions. Uh, they uh, can be quite aggressive with erosion into underlying tissue, leading to a ring abscess. And if they involve the uh, cardiac pacemaker cells, they can cause arrhythmias. Uh, sub subacute infections tend to be less destructive than acute infections. Uh, so here we have two examples uh, of infective endocarditis. This is uh, a strep viridans inflammation uh, or infection, which we can see on a myxomatous uh, mitral valve. So uh, here are the, uh, uh, the vegetations here. And then here we see Staphylococcus aureus involving a bicuspid aortic valve. So you can see the vegetations here. These are uh, much more destructive. And here we have formation of a ring abscess where we have actual erosion into the cardiac muscle. So what do we see histologically? Here's a really nice section where you can see uh, the cardiac muscle and the attached uh, valve. Uh, and even at this power, you can see that something is going on. This is a little bit too densely purple. Let's look on higher magnification. Uh, and we can see here, this is actual inflammation of the valve tissue. And we can recognize this by these sheets of neutrophils. So that's telling us this is a bacterial uh, infection. And you can see areas of necrosis here. So this patient is on their way to having uh, complete destruction of that valve, which can lead to acute regurgitation. Uh, the next entity I want to discuss is non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, which, as I mentioned, are about 1 to 5 millimeter nodules of sterile thrombi on healthy or damaged valve leaflets. I've already uh, mentioned that they're loosely attached and non-destructive, and they can embolize easily. The risk factor for NBTE is going to be hypercoagulable states such as chronic disseminated intravascular coagulation. Now, I recommend that you review the video on disseminated intravascular coagulation to understand the difference between acute and chronic DIC. 
Chronic DIC tends to arise in the setting of an underlying malignancy, especially mucinous adenocarcinomas, because these malignancies are releasing procoagulant factors into the blood, leading to this chronic uh, state of uh, hypercoagulation. We can also see non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis in individuals who have trauma, such as an indwelling catheter. This is the appearance of our non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, and you can see it actually uh, somewhat mimics what we see uh, in that um, subacute uh, infection of the myxomatous uh, mitral valve uh, with strep viridan. So we have these one to five millimeter um, uh, vegetations here on the lines of closure. But when we look uh, under the microscope, we can clearly see these are not infectious. These are very bland. You can see they're composed uh, primarily of uh, fibrin and and um, uh, platelets. There are a few uh, entrapped cells here, uh, but we certainly don't see the acute inflammation that we would expect uh, in a bacterial uh, endocarditis. Uh, and what we can see here is this line of cleavage. They're very loosely attached. They do not invade into the valve. This allows them to be easily flicked off into the circulation. Uh, the final uh, entity I want to consider for you is Liebman-Sachs endocarditis, also known as endocarditis of systemic lupus erythematosus. These are one to four millimeter sterile vegetations that can uh, present on any valve surface or even uh, on the heart wall itself. And these are caused by immune complex deposition and complement activation, which leads uh, in Liebman-Sachs endocarditis to an intense valvulitis with fibrinoid necrosis of the valve. Now, these don't tend to be uh, flicked in the circulation, but they can cause persistent injury with valvular scarring and leaflet injury that can be so severe that it can mimic what we see in rheumatic heart disease. Now, I'm showing you uh, the Liebman-Sachs endocarditis in comparison with what we see with rheumatic heart disease and non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, just for a quick compare and contrast. So you can see here we have our minute vegetations of RHD, we have our sterile vegetations of uh, NBTE, and we have these one to five millimeter vegetations uh, that we can see in Liebman-Sachs uh, endocarditis. So as always, here are some questions uh, that you can use to review the material I've just covered. I hope you uh, find this video helpful. Thank you for your time and attention.